Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Please be seated. At Easter, I always think back to those who encouraged me in my first love of God. Some of the clergy who influenced me were in many ways, looking back, frankly, a bit bonkers. Beautifully bonkers, but bonkers. I remember one Sunday morning, for instance, when my slightly eccentric vicar, after administering communion at the altar, suddenly, in full vestments, walked down the aisle and out of the church door. We then all heard him start up his car and drive off. We sat there a little embarrassed, not quite knowing what to do, but being very polite Anglicans, as Alan Bennett might have said, we didn't say anything. (laughs) About five minutes later, we heard his car come back at great speed, screeched to a halt, the door slammed, and he walked up the aisle, still in full vestments, and at the altar said in a loud voice, I left the chicken on high, let us pray. It's good to hear laughter, and medieval Bavarians would have been very proud of you because we know that they enjoyed something called Rhesus Pascalis, the laughter of Easter. When the preacher would often encourage the congregation on this day to celebrate the Lord's resurrection by prolonged laughter. And if this was rather difficult to get going, as I suspect it was, he would tell jokes to help it along. And it appears that these jokes were not sophisticated. In fact, they were a bit saucy. It must have been a bit like carry on up the pulpit. (laughs) Apparently, bishops didn't like it and tried to stamp it out But I would have given it a go this morning, except, as you will know, I don't know any such rude jokes. (laughs) Anyway, the point is this. It was thought that laughter was the only true way of celebrating Christ's resurrection. Laughter was a promise of redemption, and faith was the intuition that that promise was being kept. Laughter leveled drew people together, revealed foibles, kept pomposity in its place, hinted at something uncontrollably transcendent. I hope this cathedral will continue always to be a place of laughter, kind, joyful laughter, with, not at, people. And I'm hoping secretly that there will be a court jester employed at the next General Synod to keep everyone in check by bashing them on the head with a balloon from time to time. A bit of whoops, there goes my mitre might be quite helpful. (laughs) But for all this, we have to acknowledge that it isn't laughter that we initially find in the gospel today, but tears. Mary is crying. She's there for all of us as she's asked, Why are you weeping? Well, where do we begin? For the beauty of the world groaning under pollution and plastic? For those whose life will end in parts of the world most of us will never see while we sit here because of military or terrorist aggression and unspeakable cruelties that make us nervous of putting the news on? Or will we cry out of fear for those who are just about struggling to get by? Or for a Western world now being described not as post-war, but pre-war? Or will there be tears of anger for the demise of truth in public debate? For black lives that don't matter to some? Or tears for those seeking refuge who are more like us than we like to admit? or tears for those in this our city being killed by knives or drugs, or for the fact that a popular Times columnist can yesterday 
speak of human lives as units in deficit or surplus to the collective? Or will it be tears for our own life, for the one we've lost, the bed we can't manage to get out of because the day ahead feels unbearable? Or those tears of the Western world, having enough to live with but not much to live for? Mary stood weeping. She understands. And tears are a gift. Good things often begin when we let ourselves cry. The question that begins the spiritual life is asked by Jesus, tell me, why are you weeping? Upset, Mary seems to want everything as it had been, to take hold of the one she loves, to put everything together as it once was. Again, we understand. If only I could be back there as it used to be, it was all good then. That's us. But Jesus is teaching Mary the next step in the spiritual adventure. He teaches us that too often we would rather keep him with us where we are than let him take us where he is going. It is better to let him take hold of us. In other words, if you're serious about your tears, about the hard full stops in you being turned into commas, then align your life to the journey of an unpredictable God, not to places where you feel safe but half dead. He gave us a prayer to help us, your kingdom come, not my kingdom stay. And there will be no resurrection to celebrate if, just as he rises and reaches out his hand, we bury ourselves. Unless we dare to let go of who we are, we will never become who we might yet be. And it always takes risks to become you, the you that God longs to see come to fruition. And it often hurts before we can hear our own name spoken with love. But when we do, we're aware of everything that we've borne in the past and all that we haven't yet been. And it's all in that one word, Mary. Her name heard, Mary is lastly given a mission, to go into the city. She's to go into the center of religious and political life where decisions are made, where the poor look for help, where neighbors don't know each other very well, where a lot of foreigners pitch up, where you can feel very important or very ignored. And it's there where resurrection faith, that is the faith that we are shouting about today, must find its way through. As the poet Manly Hopkins prays, may he, Easter in us, be a dayspring to the dimness of us. Mary's thoughts are ours, of course. What can little me do in such a big city and a world in need of such repair? So start resurrecting hope, one person, one relationship, one day at a time. Cynicism is the enemy. I've always been inspired by Martin Luther's comment that even if I knew the world would end tomorrow, I would still plant my little apple tree. So that story we heard is about tears in a world of murder and grief, about fear in changing or having courage for a totally new way of being you, cities and towns longing for fresh vision to arrive, probably in women rather than men in suits. Hmm. And some say this story has no relevance. Nothing could be more urgent. Faith in the resurrection is not a story we tell to see if you like it or not. As St. John and those first story keepers knew, it was a story that was only just beginning to be continued in you and me. Can we use the gift of our tears and with a heart's release follow Jesus Christ as our new compass 
to navigate this world. If you believe in Christ's resurrection, it is time to stand up for this faith, to come out of your tomb, to become an ambassador for love and for hope, or else, what is the point? I want to end with a story. When I was in the United States in 2015, there was a young, unarmed black man shot dead by a policeman in Ferguson, Missouri. His name was Michael Brown. A makeshift memorial was built up on the street where he died, and there was a cardboard box painted black with gold letters written on it. They simply said, they tried to bury us. They didn't know we are seeds. Those words had been used by indigenous people in Mexico, were originally written by a Greek poet marginalized throughout his life. You did anything to bury me, he wrote, but you forgot I was a seed. Today, Christ speaks those words and speaks them still wherever there is oppression. The story is clear. And in the resurrection appearances, when Jesus appears, he often says in translation in our Bibles, peace be with you, sounding a bit like a vicar. What he says is shalom, which is really, hi, it's me. I'm here where we always were. I'm not going anywhere. My place is with you. I love you and I will always, always be here with you. His is a love that is much stronger than the worst thing you have ever done. Death is dead and love has taken its place. As in Mary, so in us. The tomb is empty, so make this day the beginning of your new life. I've led reflections through this week using poems, so I must end with a short one now, and one which has an extraordinary final image just for today. It is by George Herbert, and it is called The Dawning. Awake, sad heart, whom sorrow ever drowns. Take up thine eyes, which feed on earth. Unfold thy forehead, gathered into frowns. Thy saviour comes, and with him, mirth. Awake. Awake, and with a thankful heart his comforts take. But thou dost still lament and pine and cry and feel his death, but not his victory. Arise, sad heart, if thou dost not withstand Christ's resurrection, thine may be. Do not by hanging down break from the hand which, as it riseth, raiseth thee. Arise, arise, and with his burial linen dry thine eyes. Christ left his grave clothes that we might, when grief draws tears or blood, not want a handkerchief. <laughs>